This is the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Invincible Season 2, Episode 6, It's Not That Simple. Kate Chaw was a fearless warrior. Though her powers came from a family curse, she believed they were a gift to help those around her. That was Kate's real power. Her unwavering belief that this world is good. Even when it killed her over and over and over again. Kate never stopped believing that. And encouraged me to do the same. Kate Shaw was a kindred soul. Welcome back, fellow Guardians, to the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Invincible Season 2, Episode 6. It's not that simple, but it is that simple because I am one your host, Chris. And I'm your other host, Derek. See? Simple. Yeah. Simple pimple. Simples. Uh, Two hosts. Yep. We get this done. It's going to be great. Absolutely. Absolutely excited to be back uh, for a second episode of Invincible in the second half of the second season. All the Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Two, 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 two. And it's an episode. Mm-hmm. I oof, spoiler alert! I liked it. It was a out. really good episode. It was great to see it. Uh, see what actually happened after the end of episode five. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect uh, what we got in this episode. So uh, yeah, very very excited to talk about this one. And I really enjoy how they're kind of bookending a lot of this. Like we kind of these last two kind of could be watched back to back and kind of have mm-hmm. a nice neat end, beginning end and middle and end part to multiple stories. And then with the mid credit here, we see how they're going to set up towards a more, towards the back end, the final two episodes as we kind of aim into this yeah. end of season two. Absolutely. I know I say this a lot, um, with, uh, Invincible, but so much goes on in the 40, 45 minutes, uh, of these episodes or 50 minutes in some cases. So, uh, lots going on in each of the episodes, lots to talk about. So, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast though, you can subscribe to the podcast by going over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. Subscribe over there and you get access to all the shows that we're covering, including the two other shows that we're covering every week at the moment, uh, Shogun and Star Wars The Bad Batch, along with Invincible have episodes coming out every week at the moment. So, uh, lots and lots of stuff from us on TV Podcast Industries and almost a thousand other episodes as well uh, of other stuff you might be interested in. But we also want to hear your thoughts. We're recording a little bit in advance for these episodes and we are uh, reading out your thoughts and, and feedback on the previous episode each week. Uh, so if you want to send in your thoughts on this episode or any other episode of Invincible, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or join us over at our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Yes. With all that said and done though, Derek, would you like to tell us who gave us what, where, when, and how with the episode details for this one? Of course, yes. The show is created by Robert Kirkman, Corey Walker, and Ryan Otley. Uh, This episode was written by Vivian Lee. Uh, She was a writer on three episodes of the excellent horror mystery show From and three episodes of the sci-fi family adventure series Lost in Space. So she has some precedence for um, space set drama. (laughs) <laughs> before and it's like comedy in there as well uh but uh, yeah the excellent show from have you seen any of from at all chris it's in my to watch bar it's okay. like i've seen it the i've seen the trailers <laughs> and i'm like i have to watch this this looks amazing yeah and it's one of those i have to finish it to get there i think it'd be right up your alley we watched um we watched i think the first season in about two days we just couldn't stop watching it it's excellent and then the second season is uh really good as well uh looking forward to it returning uh but yeah vivian with three episodes over on that and um, the director of this episode is sol Choi. um sol directed the first episode of this season invincible as well yeah we're keeping it in the family exactly always a good thing exactly keeping those directors on board always good chris do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for invincible 206 it's not that simple sure King Lizard quickly puts a bullet in Rexplode's brain, but it's not enough to kill the hero, and he quickly beats the Lizard League's leader with everything he has left. The GDA arrives just in time to save him and Shrinking Ray. They take them to their facility to recover, along with the bodies and body parts of the dead duplicate. 
Meanwhile, back in space, Shapesmith transforms into a shield to protect Rudy. This gives him enough time to create a device to stop the attacks of the Sequids and free the human astronaut Russ Livingston. They escape with Russ in tow and the Martian chasing them down, looking to punish Shapesmith for his part in the release of the Sequids. Back in Earth, while at the funeral of the Duplicate, the Immortal realises that there was something different about their relationship. He thought they'd have longer together. Amber and Mark are also questioning their relationship and seek outside counsel. Adam Eve tells Amber that she needs to spend her time so she can with Mark. While Art, the super tailor, tells Mark the exact same thing. Later at Mark's home, Debbie finds a nanny to help with her new alien stepson, who she has named Oliver. Even though April the nanny works for the GDA, she convinces Debbie that she is the right person for the job. The GDA are also responsible for returning William's boyfriend Rick back to his full health after he was turned into Reaniman. He's back in college, but is he still the same man he once was? While at Back at Arts, Mark tells him of Omniman's advice to read the books he wrote. Art gives him a copy of his old poor selling sci-fi novels when Mark reads them he believes there's something hidden in the books that could help him beat the Vulturemites his theory is confirmed when Alan the alien visits them to try and bring Mark into the coalition of planets Alan tells him his father's stories are of legendary creatures and planets that might help them turn the tide of the battle against the Vulturemites meanwhile as Russ Livingston tries to settle back into his apartment after returning from space a road sequid repossesses his body. In a secret location deep in space, Omni Man has not been executed. He is being held by the Vulturemite Empire. If he renounces his ways, he'll be allowed to rejoin the Empire. But General Krieg believes Earth must be dealt with for their part in changing the formerly loyal Vulturemite. In a mid credit scene, Angstrom Levi gets all dressed up and travels through many many universes to meet an old friend see told you there was loads going on there's a lot in this <laughs> doesn't feel like it again you just said that like the 40 minutes they pack in a lot in these 40 mm-hmm. 45 minutes yes they do and it's only when you kind of read it all out there you're like oh oh i forgot about that part. Yeah. oh and that part yeah i forgot about that part too <laughs> well that's why we do the synopsis of course to make sure that you don't forget uh, what happened in the episode or which episode we're talking about in case you're watching it at uh, three or five months or ten months or three years after the episodes have aired now you know exactly what happened in the episode and we're of course gonna talk about it with our big points from the episode exactly so let's get into it let's get into our top points for this one top point number one Somehow Rex has returned slash survived slash what the he got a hole in his head. <laughs> well, I will I will say a huge compliment to them for opening the episode with the trigger pull from King Lizard um, because it left it on a cliffhanger last week and that cliffhanger was resolved very quickly in this episode. But I absolutely just expected they were opening the episode with Rex explodes death um, after seeing Kate and uh, Shrinking Ray die last week. Uh, I thought they were just opening it with the death of, of Rex immediately. So did I. I. I was sitting in what I can only be described as abject terror going, oh, this is a departure mm-hmm. from the comic books. Oh, my God. They're really just going to kill him off. Yeah. And he does it. Like, and it's a fun. It's, again, it feels almost Kill Bill-esque. Kind of Quentin Tarantino. Right. You think the bride is dead. Mm-hmm. She ain't dead. Yeah. 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 Um, and I enjoyed it, I have to say, but that that hole is a big, giant hole. Oh, just the fact that every time he talks or moves, uh, it spurts even more blood out of his brain, uh, or out of the hole in the front of his head, anyway. Um, I also like the gag of it. Uh, Rex Blood is not well known as uh, the smartest tool in the uh, in the Guardians of the, of the Globe's uh, chest. So having the joke of, even a bullet in your brain didn't kill you, um, <laughs> is, a, is a, a possibly a nod to him being the uh, the least smart of the group. <laughs> so I thought that was a little, a little joke they were having on Rex. Uh, but it is it is great, you know, as, as, it, as it goes on. He effectively, um, it looks like he beats King Lizard to death with the stump of his arm uh, and a headbutt from uh, that, that uh, bullet 
ridden head that he gets. Um, now, they kind of pull him off from the guards that come in, kind of pull him off him, I think, before we see King Lizard actually die. But um, yeah. he's pretty close. He's He is beating him to a pulp. Yeah. I'm interested to see if the Lizard League comes back once again. Mm. Like, are they going, is this the end or is it just going to be like... Now, is he because he was beaten so badly he can't use his arms and legs and just kind of slithers on the ground? Uh-huh, maybe. <laughs> is this the, art, the new, latest origin? <laughs> um, and also, just explaining how Rex survives, mm-hmm. that's the one I was kind of hoping we'd get. Right. They, they kind of don't. Yeah, they don't mention it at all. They just, uh, yeah. they just say that he does. Because Rex's yeah. power, and again, we've said this before about the, about the, um, peripheral characters within invincible that unless they are invincible we don't really get an explanation of who they are we don't get a real detailed rundown of their power set we got quite a bit of it with that with the adam eve special and we definitely think i think after this episode definitely i want to see a rexplode special and find out where he came from who he is what his powers really are uh more so than anything else so i do wonder given that he was featured quite heavily in the adam eve special last season i do wonder if they'll uh, announce that there is already is a rexplode special come between season two and season three maybe i i think you're on i think i know we discussed it but i think you're on something now yeah. after seeing this and seeing how they're changing his ways how they're kind of kind of re zeroed in on him and his mm-hmm. survival yeah i'm like okay this is the perfect time he's trying to, like, it can literally be, I'll write it right here for Kirkman. Like, <laughs> Mr. Kirkman, come on over. But essentially, it's him trying to train to get back to be cleared for duty at the GDA. And he's having trouble. And it's a sit down about how he got his power so he can dig deep mm-hmm. and refine. Because he's going to essentially be one armed. Yeah. So, so it's going to be like. Well, he's, get, he's getting his brand new free hand from the GDA, as Mark points out yeah. later, on, later on. So that could be uh, an Inspector Gadget type hand with loads of extra abilities uh, granted to him <laughs> from the GDA. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It could, blood. it could be something like that, you know? But we also learned little things about him in the Adam Eve movie where he was effectively living with, uh, with Eve. Um, unbeknownst to her parents um, so we kind of learned a bit about that we we learned from uh, this episode when Eve comes and delivers some um, some uh, home furnishing books to him that he loves them because he doesn't he's never really had a home of his own so there's lots of history there to explore I think with Rex and they seem to nod to it more for him than for any of the other characters I feel yeah so no I agree uh, yeah so that feels like there's they will be setting up something uh in the future with him but great to see him there because I, I have to say that opening scene when he gets the bullet in the head I absolutely thought that was the end and that was the last we'd ever see of Rexplode it's very Game of Thrones-esque mm-hmm. and I mean in that it's they're not afraid to kill off these characters mm-hmm. so I was like oh oh no maybe he is and that's but part of me goes but Jason Mantoukas voices him mm-hmm. he's too big they're not gonna i'm like well no of course they are they're they're 100 gonna kill off people yeah um so yeah absolutely happy that he survived yes, i think is absolutely. the best way but because you did not expect it and also happy to see some of these very cool little details about his life yeah absolutely but also i think it was quite surprising to see that shrinking ray survived as well she crawls out of the neck uh stump i guess of uh of komodo dragon um Still shrunken down, but it seemed like last week he'd squeezed her to death inside his body, and we'd just seen he spat out the blood uh, from inside himself uh, after she died. So I was really surprised to see her alive. Again, with this show, even when you see them die on screen, characters come back. <laughs> so it's uh, so there's nothing, like there's nothing... Um, the old adage of comics, if you didn't see them die, then they're not dead. You know, if you didn't see the funeral, then they're not dead. In this show, it seems like even if you see them die on screen, they can come back. Even if you see the funeral, they might come back as well. So, uh, yeah, can't, can't tell at all. Um, but it is good to see that not everybody died on that mission. No, exactly. But Duplicate did. Yes. And she is so far dead as a doornail. Absolutely. They do have uh, the have funeral multiple, for yeah. multiple doornails in a dead door. Because she can duplicate her doornails. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, and they have the funeral. And it, it's mm-hmm. somewhat nice. It in is. That, like, you do get this weird, as our listeners have heard, weird eulogy by the immortal, um, which is kind of cute, kind of sad, kind of, what the? Okay. Um, 
I, I, I found it a bit like on the nose in terms of he's that kind of blubbering lover who lost someone. I was like, okay. But it is something, it is very real, if you want to call it that. Mm. In terms of, but also still strange because, again, they've only been dating and for a while. Yes, and, and I like that they have the conversation. Black Samson and um, Immortal have the conversation about why does he feel this way about Duplicate? He's had lovers many times. He's been yeah. around for thousands of years um why would it be duplicate that would cause this problem because he survived the death of lovers before you know um obviously many times so why duplicate and i, I think it kind of goes back to the conversation they had last season or the other half of the season where duplicate explained to him that every time one of her duplicates dies she feels the death and immortal was saying well every time i die even though i can come back from it i feel the death completely so there's that connection between the two of them that he may not have had with somebody else before so he felt because he's immortal when he dies and comes back and duplicate keeps coming back over and over again that potentially they could have lived together forever so uh, or for a very long time at least so it's that thing of being impacted by the actual death of someone you thought could never die um, yeah. So, yeah, I thought that was a really good conversation and, and uh, really interesting to see his reaction to her death. Yeah. yeah, we're seeing the growth of the immortal as a character throughout this. Yeah. So we, we see him grow in terms of how he dealt with Mark up on the, mm-hmm. on, the, on the spaceship. We see him here discussing the duplicate kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. And we see him kind of start to kind of... I don't want to say soften, but become a better leader, mm. if you want to call it that, Yes, throughout this. So it, it, it's, again, showing that the typical character arcs that you think you're going to see in a lot of these shows, and it's just not what to expect when it comes to Invincible. Exactly, exactly. But it is a really good one, and I have to say, I know we did play the clip up front, but that line in his eulogy did make me laugh really hard about uh, about duplication. Um Believing the uh, the Earth was great for her, even though it keeps killing her over and over and over again. <laughs> I thought that was really good, <laughs> even though it wasn't meant I as a joke. Uh, I thought it was quite funny. No. Uh, it was wordplay. It was meant. <laughs> um, speaking of the spaceship battle, should we move up to point number two? Absolutely. So, this is very much just all about the Guardians of the Globe saving Ross Livingston up and up on there is a big spaceship mm-hmm. from the Sequids. And it's this battle that we do see Robot do his thing. We see essentially like Robot and even uh, Adam Eve get kind of retaken. But you see Invincible and Immortal doing their thing, c- coming together, saving the world, learning to work together again, kind of putting aside differences. Yes. Very much your superhero trope. Yeah, but, but it is but, a very big thing for Immortal yes. to admit that Mark's better and faster than him. Um, again, for those of you who don't remember, uh, Immortal has had a huge problem with Mark because his father's the one that killed the original Guardians of the Globe, including him. And yep. so, and he's always thought he should be the protector of the world. Um, when Omni Man came into the picture, uh, he kind of took over that position uh, from the Immortal and then killed everybody. So he was the spy amongst their myths almost. So uh, Immortals always felt the that he would never let Mark into that position because he trusted one person before and that person ended off killing all of his friends and all of his colleagues. So, um, so here, this moment where he admits Mark is stronger, Mark is faster and gives him the, um, the weapon that they used to, to, uh, cure Russ Livingston and save him, uh, is a big moment for a bottle. He wouldn't do that otherwise. And we also hear him compliment Eve later on for her, uh, part in, in the work that the Guardians do. She's not a member of the Guardians. She's there and he actually compliments her and thanks her for her work. So, uh, softening definitely, uh, immortal is, uh, seems to be. So that sounded very Yoda like, didn't it? Softening, he seems to be. <laughs> but, but that's also very important. And again, just to quickly bring it back, um, this is another, the big cliffhanger from last episode. How are they going to get out of this? And actually, they get out of it with the help of Shapes- Shapesmith using his abilities to create this shield over the two members of the Guardians of the Globe that can be overtaken by Sackwards. I questioned that last week as to why all of these heroes were going to space. And actually, almost everybody that was chosen couldn't have been penetrated by the Sequids because they all had armor or their abilities project- protected them. It was only Robot, yep. and Rudy was inside Robot, so he couldn't have been attacked, and Eve was using her powers to make her own suit of armor, effectively. Um, but that 
armor fell off when her powers failed and Rudy was outside robot uh, doing this work so both of them could be attacked and were uh, possessed by the yeah. Sequids uh, after their, their plan went. And I really just want to call out the animation in this one. Mm. The the fight sequence here and the, even just that, that last flight by Mark mm-hmm. just looked fantastic. Yeah, and did. again, I, prob- I probably belabor this to a lot, but the actual choreography, if you want to call it that, mm. the storyboarding of how these fights happen across a lot of the Invincible ones. So even back where the beginning where we saw the first multiverse and you saw Mark and Omni-Man take down all the heroes. Mm-hmm. Beautifully shot. And the choice of how they track the shot, the, mm-hmm. the, they storyboarded it. Again, I don't call it tracking, but the camera does move yeah. around like them. As that. Yeah. But again, it's just how they set up these fights, Yeah, how it all kind of comes together. And it is, for me, seeing a comic book come to life. Yeah, it's Not in an, an animatic, just an actual... Like, they have put pen to paper, pixel to pixel, yeah. and really just brought this this fight scenes, the, these things that were very flat to such visceral bit, because you get the blood, you get, not the gore, but you get mm. squishiness of sequins. Yes, I, th- I think will. I think gore is a good a good word for what you're seeing with all the uh, with all the squishing. Uh, but I, I will definitely say I agree with you. I think that the animation's great for this show, but it's within a certain style as well. It isn't yes. supposed to be like The Bad Batch, which is one of the best animated looking shows out there. It's absolutely beautiful animation, and they, they're all about the detail. This show is in a 90s, uh, Naughty's animation style. So, yeah. so when you see a pack of a million sequids, they haven't hand drawn all million of them where you can pick out individual features on the sequids. They are looking at a mass of of pink to represent millions and yeah. millions of sequins. It's within the style, but it's done so well. And you're right, the actual uh, animation and motion of uh, what's happening in these scenes and these fights, they're really dynamic. They're really well, uh, really well put together. They're very exciting, yeah. uh, definitely. Especially probably because you've just come off the death of all the three... Guardians of the Globe on Earth, or you think you have, coming into this scene, you're going, oh, God, who's going to die up here in space now? <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. And it's fun, then, because the way it does end is, like, we do see, then, Mark take on the ships mm. as they escape from the Martians. Well, yes, yeah, so, um, again, a great conversation, a great a great uh, back and forth between the Martians as they're all running away, and they go, we thank you so much for saving us, but you can't leave here with uh, with Shapesmith um, because he's effectively the killer of our race. So uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to punish him for it. Mark asks, "What's that punishment?" And they go, "We're going to have to kill him." And then that's it. They're on they're on the spaceship. They're yeah. on they're running away with all the, uh, the the Martian ships chasing them. Really good fun. <laughs> and then, but even just seeing how Mark takes them out at one point, he just mm. goes literally vertical and then just drops down through, and then stops and is like. All right, time for you to go, and then just kind of went goes down back through the bottom. It's what you expect from a Superman, almost mm-hmm. taking it like fighter planes. Exactly, exactly. Um, it was great to see. Yeah, but we thought that was the end of the sequence. Mm-hmm. Later in the show, we do see the regurgitation of a sequid. Uh, so the sequids now are back on Earth, along with the the the, the once glorious and Slightly better astronaut. A poor Ross Leffingston. I feel so sorry for him. He gets back to his apartment that Shapespit's been living in and destroying uh, for the last few months, uh, trying to clean it up, and then throws up and gets repossessed by a <laughs> by a sequid. Uh, so we had about hmm, an hour of not being controlled by the sequid. I love again. I love that moment when um, he's in the. I think it's in the GDA uh, headquarters where they're taking care of him in the hospital anyway. And he just goes, they just won't let me sleep. They never let me sleep. They never sleep. So I didn't sleep. And it looks like it's been a year uh, where he's just been wide awake the whole time seeing what's going on. So he looks very, very put upon. And then, as I say, getting back to his apartment, seeing it trashed as well. So he's not having a good life, poor old Russ. No. And I did think this was a dream. I was expecting that kind of jolt, Mm -hmm. kind of startle awake. And it's like, oh, it was all fine. But no, like the sequins are there. They're here. And... They're going to slowly repopulate the Earth. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it, it's it's shocking because yeah, we we heard all about the fact that there's a there are uni minds. So once one is attached to Russ Livingston again, the rest of them are awakened. The rest of them know what's happening. So yeah, I guess uh, they're going to draw them down to Earth, and they could be uh, possessing humans left, right, and center uh, from from mm. now on. So uh, that's a big deal, um, especially because of how 
overwhelm the Guardians of the Globe were on uh, on the spaceship. So I guess it's not going to be much better when they're spread out across the planet. Mm, interesting thread to follow. Wait till season three for that one. Maybe, maybe, yeah. All of a sudden they'll encounter a massive group of uh, of, <laughs> of sequid uh, possessed uh, humans on Earth. That'll be interesting. It will be. Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested to see how that future goes forward. Uh-huh. But do you know whose future may not be going forward? Well, yeah. Our point number three. Mm-hmm. Amber, Mark, and their relationship. I enjoyed this. Mm. This is very much that kind of... You'd expect to see... You said this the style of these this fight and the cartoon is very 90s or yeah. 2000s. This is almost what you see in a sitcom from the 90s and early well, 2000s where it cuts between mm-hmm. two conversations and it's one singular conversation in terms of it's the same thing being said about the, the thing. I enjoyed how this was put together mm-hmm. and what it is essentially saying is that, yeah, that these two are not destined to be together. These two should, yeah. if they try to put a bit of work in, but they just don't think it's right and it's probably not going to end well. Yeah, it's a, it's an odd one, isn't it? It's, it's both of them are frustrated in their relationship, but feel they can't be frustrated because Mark's a superhero and he's saving people. So, yeah. Uh, so effectively, Amber's kind of going, "Well, I can't complain about it. I can't complain about him not being here because he's saving human lives." Yeah. Like, how how desperate would I be if I say you left me at dinner on my own because you had to go and save a hundred people on the other side of the planet? You know, how awful would it be if I said that to him? Um, but it's uh, I think the advice they both get is just make time for each other. And if you don't make time for each other, then you can't possibly be together, right? So, um, yeah. so yeah, but it is I, it's so well cut together. I like that Mark goes to talk to Art. Seems like an odd uh, person to go to talk to. For, for him, he does have other friends to talk to, but uh, William, probably not the best uh, relationship advice uh, at the moment. And uh, Amber's kind of going, well, William's Mark's friend, so I can't really talk to him. So she goes to talk to Eve, who's also a superhero, who has only had one relationship in her life, so she's not exactly right relationship savvy but it was interesting that those choices were, were the ones that were made and both of them gave the same advice to uh, each party and the way it was added together was really good i i like art art for me is a good yeah. choice because he's so used to he's human and so used to kind of dealing with superheroes and we mm-hmm. know that he was very close to omni man and debbie yeah um and he's even like been over to see debbie since yeah omni man has true. left that's true and it's also Mark Hamill, so any way anyway, to squeeze Mark Hamill into the show is yeah. always good. Even um, Amber, yeah, I agree with that one. That was just like, no, she should have just gone to some, she should have gone to one of her girlfriends and it should have been a conversation about, like, he's saving kids in Africa <laughs> type thing. And yeah. it's like just a really bad lie. Uh-huh. I enjoy how it kind of, for me, it was the editing. It was just how yeah. that was, conversation was brought together. But it's a big point in that this may spell the end by the end of the season for this relationship. Mm. Um, they may not, no, and it may end amicably, may not. Yeah. But time will tell. I feel like there's quite a lot of nods in this episode uh, about, uh, about what's happening and what could happen in the future. Um, you know, we see the hug between. Uh, Eve and Mark after they've survived the Martian attack and uh, Mark gets a little red in the face and gets a bit happy about the hug, I guess. Yep. Um, and then we hear when Rex Blode tells Eve that uh, that Mark and Amber's relationship is um, and she asks him to explain further that we see Eve might be very interested in an idea that, uh, that Amber and Mark might have broken up. So I think it's pretty likely we're going to see the two of them together at some point in the future. Yes, but who? Who knows? It makes it makes the world a lot less complex if both of you are superheroes in a relationship, I presume. Yes, but of course you should know that. But then it's like it's not. Of course you wouldn't. You've got a secret identity. Don't don't reveal my secret identity, Chris. And that John is also a superhero. Yes. <laughs> I don't think editing a podcast is a superpower, though. But th- yeah, but thank I don't you. know. You find you find time in the day where there is no time in the day. <laughs> yeah, that's it's the, a superpower. That's the only power I have is the Superman power of turning back the planet uh, to turn back time, <laughs> <laughs> just by running yeah. really fast. But it is a really big thing, and again, I like how maturely they write the story of Amber and Mark's um, relationship. It's not as simple as she will always be there and wait for him. She does have to have questions and question whether she's allowed to be frustrated in a relationship where her partner is a, a superhero. I, I really like that. I think that's a, that's, you know, I don't often call uh, 
this type of show mature, uh, but it is mature in its own way as yeah. well. So, uh, so it's really good. Yeah, I, did, I did like those scenes. Should we move on to our final point? Yes, yes, our final major point, because Alan's yeah. coming home, uh, back to Earth, if he can find the way. Uh, <laughs> he does question himself when he's when he's standing above Earth, doesn't he? He's kind of going, "All right, I'm here now. Um, it was Urath that he was supposed to be monitoring, and that's why he was above Earth in season one. That's how himself and Mark met the first time. But here he is above this entire planet, going, "Where did Mark say he lives again? <laughs> how do I find him now?" And it's uh, it's Immortal that comes and confronts him because Immortal's really angry about what's happened, wants to go out and punch something, and comes straight out into space uh, when he hears the alien presence out there to uh, try and beat the crap out of Alan. Yeah, and I, this gives off some of the best comedic energy. It's pure Seth Rogen mm-hmm. in that, like, you get this that the two way telepathic communication uh-huh. only works two ways. Yes. It's like, we can't have a three way conversation. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, that's clever. And I, love, that's and I love how frustrated Immortals get with the idea that this guy can talk into his brain. He's like, get out of my mind. <laughs> As if he's controlling it rather than just being able to talk to him. I uh, thought that was really good. Again, this kind of repeat of the mistaken identity of the first time Alan was there and fought with Mark and now he's fighting with Immortal uh, while Mark's trying to calm down Immortal again they don't have the greatest relationship either but eventually he does calm down uh, Immortal and tell him who Alan is and gets him back to the planet yeah and then we do get this fun reveal uh, all about the 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 books that Omni-Man was writing. Yes, of course, because Art had a copy of the other set of books. So yes. we were joking about the the uh, direction that came um, from Omni-Man to, uh, to Invincible uh, to go and read his travel books, and maybe he'd find out some, <laughs> some secret information hidden within the travel books. It wasn't the travel books. It was the sci-fi books that Nolan uh, had written when he was uh, when he was a bit younger, um, and that didn't sell really well, because true sci-fi doesn't sell very well, apparently. <laughs> No sci-fi sells well. well yeah. no, it's not. Unless you're Game of Thrones. Uh, no, I, this was fun, I Fantasy Chris. It's a completely true, different yeah. series. <laughs> Unless you're Star uh, Wars related or Star, Star Trek related. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, this was fun because you get to see that they like in actual fact that Nolan was just writing about like planets and things mm-hmm. that could potentially hurt the Vulturemites. They were his reports back to the Vulturemite Empire. Yes, that's what it seems like. So yeah. these were kind of his reports come added with, so we saw the, the, the Space Rider mm-hmm. um, with his gun that can take on anything and destroy anything. Yes. We saw this pack of an- feral animals, but because of the gravity on that planet, mm-hmm. their talons and kind of beaks or mouths could tear into Vulturemite's skin. The Ragnar, yes. The Ragnar. Yeah. Um, so just really fun seeing what starts as kind of very stylized, childish kind of sci-fi pop twist to what actual the truth is. Exactly. And it also felt like little minisodes in the middle of the Invincible show because you have the yeah. actual... Um, while Mark's reading the story, you have the visualization of the story itself uh, being shown on screen. Uh, I like that, of course, Nolan is the protagonist as well in, uh, in both of these. He's the one visiting the planet. He's the main character, so they have, uh, have are able to have uh, Nolan in there. Um, but yes, there's two two new weapons that have been found here. The, uh, the Infinity Ray, which could potentially damage Viltrumites, and uh, the Ragnar, that if you could weaponize them in some way, they could rip apart a, a, a Viltrumite. Yeah. Interesting. I loved how this was done. Mm-hmm. I loved how it came together. It was like, it's an, it's a fun way of showing not just kind of like, hey, here, go on this quest to find these five things. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, read this book that's stylized into 1960s pulp sci fi mm-hmm. and try and discover the meaning. So I think we'll get more of it um, as we see towards the end of this episode that Nolan's alive. He is not dead. He is being held on the Vulturemite deep prison or deep space prison. Yeah. And is being told to he's fully healed, but he's being told to kind of repent, come back to the Vulturemite the Empire. 
and be part of us because they're going to take down Earth. Absolutely. And it is a really interesting quirk of the Viltrumites, isn't it? That they do believe they are Nazis. They are space Nazis. They do believe that they are the master race. And the one thing that they can't abide is killing another Viltrumite for whatever reason. So even though Nolan turned on them, even though Nolan went against them, even though Nolan tried to kill other Viltrumites, they are going, um, if you just repent now, you'll be able to rejoin the Empire. You know, they took him back to sentence him to death. That's what we were told. That's what Mark was told. He's going to die. Um, you have to take over his mission because he's going to be put to death. But here they are again, extending the hand to him saying, well, you can just repent and come back into the Empire. Uh, Nolan doesn't say anything, of course, because uh, he doesn't want to go back into the Empire. He's made his uh, he's made his choice um, and lost a lot of uh, a lot of family and friends because of it. But um, but I find it really interesting that they still are willing to extend uh, to extend to him. And there is just a, a little bit of a a touch made from um, from General Krieg, where he's saying that if Earth is the planet that changed Nolan this way and turned him against the Viltrum Empire that they need to pay. So mm, I don't know whether we're going to see uh, the Viltrumites coming to Earth and becoming uh, the leaders of Earth or whether they're just going to come down and just destroy it and go full on attack on Earth after that comment. I'm going full on attack. It's essentially, it is Man of Steel level here where you get a lot of Kryptonians coming down and destroying mm-hmm. the world. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, that I is do what think we're so. Get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's a it's a, a again another big uh, cliffhanger to leave the episode on, isn't it? Yeah, and that's what they're doing well. They 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 know how to set this up because you you are now invested in what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But that kind of concludes the majority of the episode. Yeah. Aside from the mid credit. Exactly, the return right. of Angstrom Levy. He yes. is alive and returning home to visit an old friend. I don't know why. I just got flashes of uh, of Hannibal Lecter at the end of Silence of the Lambs. I'm having an old friend for dinner. Um, there's something about the uh, the villainous side of Angstrom Levy when he's uh, when he's getting all suited and booted to go through multiple dimensions to get back to where he came from originally, the dimension he came from originally, uh, to go and visit an old friend. Um, don't know. Looked a bit evil to me. A hundred percent. He's <laughs> going after Invincible. Yeah. Yes. Invincible is the cause of his multi brain. Mm-hmm. His back brain, his side brain, his up brain, dead right <laughs> brain. Um, so it's good. I like this. This is setting up the next two episodes, I think, mm-hmm. the, the next big battle. Um, and uh, if it's going to do the storyline piece, I think it is. Okay. I can't wait. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Because, okay, the only thing I'll say, no spoilers, Mm -hmm. you've seen the multiverse, you've seen, we've seen some, we've seen what happens when uh, the, uh, the, the Mahler twins are pulled in. Mm -hmm. Imagine multiple things being pulled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Places, like we know what could happen. Like we've seen multiple Spider Men fighting against evil. I can't wait to see if they potentially do that here. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. That's entirely possible. If we see loads of different versions of our of our major characters, hey, it could at least bring back duplicate some way, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it could be just that's duplicate like, from another another multiverse or another universe. Yeah. 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 And you see how easy it is for Langstrom here as well. He literally is just walking through yeah. multiple different universes um, to pass back to where he wants to get to. Uh, so it is very, very easy for him. It's not like he's uh, he has to relax or rest up after doing one uh, trip to another multiverse. So, um, yeah, that could be really interesting. No, it's going to get fun. Mm. Um, but that brings us to the end. Yes. Yeah. Um, Do you have any notes? There are a couple of notes because a couple of things that happened in the episode. Um, Rick's back. What? Yeah. What? Uh, he's after being Rhiannon back in season one. Uh, he suddenly reappears on campus and is allowed to go back to go back to college. He seems like he's still a little bit off, and I guess it's quite interesting that it's Donald that brings him back um, to the campus as well, because Donald's still having his own issues with being yeah. with having a replicated body, and he's kind of trying to explain to William that he's had massive reconstructive surgery from being uh, Rhiannon in season one. Um, 
but you can tell you can see there's there's a moment when you see his hand kind of twitch uh in reaction to uh to the work that's been done for rick so it's interesting i wonder will rick be the same um will he be the same person that william remembers yeah or will we get a very much a similar to the sequids a re re reanima a reanima yeah <laughs> <laughs> we we got him on. Uh yeah, I'd be interested to see how they kind of pull this one together. Yeah. Uh, and what comes from it. Um again, it's a nice I think they could have dropped this thread and no one would have cared, but the fact they're bringing it back means I think is something for Rick. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And at least uh William gets something to do now as well. Yeah. So and then we should call out that we actually have a name now for Mark's half brother. Uh, he's called Oliver. Which I know you've been resisting saying for uh, for yes. about a season now, Chris, <laughs> for yep. a couple of episodes now. Uh, you've been resisting mentioning his name, but it's good to be able to have his name now. So when we mention Oliver in the future, that's Mark's half brother. So yes. much easier. And named <laughs> after uh, Debbie's father. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and again, nice call out. And yeah, I've been resisting because it's Ollie is <laughs> called out so often in the comic books, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm-hmm. yeah, yep, just don't say his name. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. it hasn't been announced in the show yet, so we're not going to say it. Um, but there is an interesting arc that's going on there uh, with um, Mark's mom, Debbie, having to take care of Oliver, this uh, kind of adopted uh, child of her of her uh, her ex husband, I guess. Um, she is being, I suppose, almost browbeaten to get a nanny that's related to the GDA. Um, yeah. And she can see instantly through anybody that's being sent to her door uh, that they're probably from the GDA until Alice arrives, the, the new nanny for Oliver, uh, the person that she accepts for the job, who walks through the door and instantly goes, look, I work for the GDA. I know everything about it, but um, I have the skills that you need. I'm on the level here. You now are fully aware of who I am, and I work for you, number one. I am here to take care of the child, I'm using the skills that I have to take care of a child and be free of uh, of all of my obligations in any other way. So, uh, so I thought that was quite interesting. So we have a new nanny uh, coming in to take care of Oliver. Yeah, and it, it, I can't wait to see. Hopefully, we get at least a scene or two of this where you're going to get the. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to kind of. It's going to be like that normal 1980s nanny bit where, like, the nanny's trying to look after a kid and it's all going crazy. But here now you get a kid with superhero powers. Yes, I'm getting flashes of um, of uh, The Incredibles. Um, yes, yeah, with, exactly. With the baby with multiple different powers uh, <laughs> as yes. they start to come out. So, uh, yeah, I do wonder if Oliver will get his powers quicker than Mark got them because Mark didn't get them till he was about, what, well, 16. That's what we got in the yeah. first episode of the season so uh, of the show. Um, so that's quite interesting. So, no, exactly. Um, so we can't wait to see that. Yeah, and one one final little call out that I just I just wanted to wanted to say that I really liked um, where Cecil is trying to convince um, Debbie to allow him to take uh, to take the kid into the GDA, uh, and she goes, "Well, can't have a child grow up in uh, in a government agency." And he, all he says, his only response is, "Well, we paint clouds on the ceiling for the kids. <laughs> Not even like there's a play area or they're minded all the time by well trained professionals." They paint, they paint clouds on the ceiling for the kids. So they basically huh. will be going into prison like all of the other prison, yeah. uh, imprisoned villains that we see in the GDA. Uh, but they'll just have clouds on the ceiling to look at. They look cute. <laughs> the clouds won't move, but look cute. Exactly, exactly. So what do you think, Chris, on this episode? What do you think overall? I loved it. Like this, I, I talked about the, the animation and the fight style. I talked about the, the, the editing for that conversation with Mark mark and amber just overall it's fun to see how they are bringing these stories together and some are kind of happening a lot quicker than i expected some are mm-hmm. happening a lot slower um but i'm very interested to see where we get to in these final two episodes and i think they'll set up something big in the next one mm-hmm. and then give us a really big finale again like they did century last season exactly where i still see people talk about that train scene Uh uh-huh um so it's going to be interesting absolutely yeah what about yourself yeah i really enjoyed this episode it's a it's just got a good balance of everything i think the as i say it opening with rexplode getting shot in the head and then it's still uh him still being alive um 
having the funeral of, of Duplicate. Uh, I thought it was very somber and thought it was interesting in having the development of, of the immortal and what what yeah. his relationship is uh, with uh, with Duplicate and her death. thought that was all really interesting. Uh, the breakup, I guess, of Amber and Mark or potential breakup of Amber and Mark is, uh, is, is something that was quite central in, in the episode and important to do. Um, and then, yeah, the, uh, the sequids are on Earth. Uh, they've found weapons to to go against the Viltrumites. There's so much that's going on in this episode, and so much that we probably even missed talking about. Um, but really interesting setup, but still very big moments, and still a really enjoyable episode. So they're doing really well for me this season. Love it. Excellent stuff. And do you know who else might be loving it too? Our fellow guardians, because we're going to move into our feedback section. Yes, we are. Yeah, our feedback on episode five. Chris, we got uh, an email in from Coffee and Vodka. Yes. Coffee Vodka had this to say. Greetings, fellow overwhelmed defenders. <laughs> well, gosh, I guess Invincible back to watching and writing before listening to the pod. We'll do my best not to duplicate any comments. Speaking of Kate, wow. Was happy to finally see the team in action. Should have known. With Kirkman, getting what you want isn't necessarily getting what you want. Mm-hmm. Kate and Ray being taken out by a single body who would have taken out Rex as well before a fluke of body stupidity. If he survives, maybe he can get a new name as well as a new hand. I mean, Pyrex was right there. <laughs> How many or few will survive the sacred space fight is anyone's guess. Why do so many soups vie for a place on the Guardian's team when fatalities are possible to the point of probable? <laughs> A lot of folks like to compare Invincible to the boys. One huge difference is that there are few heroes on the boys who would be willing to fill out the Guardians' ranks. That's probably true, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, but that's definitely true. Coffee went on to say, Also great to see Mark and Eve again. Even great to see Alan and his new beach bod. (laughs) Welcome back, Invincible. You've been Miss. Five purple baby diaper dumpers, whole-headed X-Rexes, and non sequitur out of five peace and take care coffee and vodka thanks coffee and vodka god these four out of five five out of fives are getting tough man like they're they're tongue twisters on their own i probably had to do a five takes on that one <laughs> um i love them. i'm so glad you're happy everything's back yeah uh i get the feeling that it's the same it's like a lot of people are like happy it's back giving them what they wanted not what they really wanted but like it's what they wanted and not what they wanted wanted or what they wanted wanted but <laughs> then there's the bad it's the it's it's the monkey's paw you get what you want but is it worth the price exactly well that's also invincible right you watch the show and uh, yeah you turn on an episode you go oh it's great to see that character and then they could be dead by the end of the episode um yeah. and then they could be alive back next episode but Maybe not uh, either, uh, but it's great also to have Coffee with Vodka back. I know um, he's not listening along to uh, Shogun, and he's not uh, he's not watching uh, the Bad Batch either. So great to have uh, Coffee with Vodka back with his thoughts about Invincible as well. Uh, lots more shows coming up this year, as as you know. Um, so there'll be lots more for you to listen to too. Uh, it is it is a really interesting point though. Um, we always compare Invincible to the boys. That's why it's on our boys' feed uh, for TV podcast industries as well. But the reason for that is more to do with the blood, the violence, and the adult content. Um, but absolutely, there are no uh, heroes in the boys. So none of them would be willing to stand up for something like Guardians of the Globe who actually take care of problems in the world. Uh, they're always set up to go after what the PR team uh, think would be good for their PR, right? So uh, yeah. that's not the Guardians of the Globe. The Guardians of the Globe are heroes that go out, put themselves in the line and could be dead um, on any given mission. Um, hey, yeah. remember, uh, Rex Blode thought he was just going to have a pizza night because uh, the rest of the team were going off to take care of the big um, challenge that they had uh, and ended off uh, killing, well, we thought at the end of that episode, killing three members of the team. So, yeah. And yeah, seeing Kate and Ray being taken out by this baddie in episode five was shocking, I think, is probably the best thing. I don't think... I think the fluke of body stupidity is very true. Um, as you've seen in episode six, like Rex is less fluky. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's just, I don't want to say lucky because that's very fluky, but uh, <laughs> probably more just there's something that's going to reason he can survive with a hole in his head. We'll have to find uh, out. But yeah, yeah we'll have, have to find, to find out. out. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Thanks so much, Coffee Bucket. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. We also got an email in from Meryl Smith, who says, Well, so far it looks like Donald has gone the Cliff Steel Robot Man path, since he's only a brain in a metallic body. 
Debbie's boss was totally hitting on her. Somebody called Toby Flenderson because here's there's a HR violation in the works. I'm curious if Kate's death is going to stick. These characters have come back from worse. My guess is that the reason we're not seeing Mark have these conversations on screen is because part of the info given out is not all of it. He's possibly keeping the, I have to take up my dad's post and there's a time clock on it and there are huge ramifications for it if you don't do it to himself until he can process it and find a way to avoid the exact outcome that's coming. I wonder where those books ended up. I like the small scene with Eve Rex alluding to the comics that there is more beneath his Rex facade because it exists because of trauma and their relationship was basically trauma bonding. Well, that's interesting, Meryl. Um, so yeah, that a little nod there maybe to uh, to some of Rex's history uh, in this episode. I, I, I'm feeling more and more that we need to see a, a, a Rex Splode uh, spin-off episode to get more of that yeah. backstory. Or we'll get an Eve and Rex kind of the early years type mm. thing. Yeah. Um before the before season one. And that will give us some of the background too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's kinda of what I think is gonna that they would do as the next movie like the Adam Eve special. That came out of nowhere. That was uh, announced and then released within the same week, wasn't it? So Oh uh, god, yeah. So yeah, that so we so good. we could be having a, a Rex Load one coming up. Uh, that's that's my feeling anyway. Um I think that's a really good theory on why um, Mark is keeping it to himself, why we're not seeing on screen that he has this uh, this big job now to take up. Um, he's just trying to find a way to avoid it, and maybe if he can find any weapon that he can find to take out the Viltrumites, maybe he doesn't have to take up that position that his dad had on Earth. Hopefully. Hopefully. I suppose we'll know in two two episodes. We may. Less than two hours. You never know. We may not know until the end of season five or oh, something, God. Chris. The, the show can uh, can change the speed at which things are delivered as well. So so we may not know for quite a while. Um, just a, a little nod uh, for those of you who may not have gotten it, because uh, I didn't, I must admit, Meryl. Um, Meryl says Toby Flenderson call him because uh, it's a HR violation. That's a character in the American version of The Office, which I've never watched. Uh, well, I watched one episode or two episodes of it, uh, but I had no idea who Toby Flenderson was. So uh, he's the HR manager in uh, in The Office. Ah, oh, there you go. That was a good one. <laughs> a- my my missus would be very happy that someone else has called it. Out. There you go. So you- I have watched it, but begrudgingly because it's on, it was on in the background. Right, right. I think I've only ever seen all the episodes of the, of the UK Office, um, which I like a lot, but uh, I didn't connect with the American one. I hear each to their own. Each to their own. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much, Meryl, for the feedback. Thanks, Meryl. Let's head on over to Facebook, Chris. Yes. First up, we have some feedback from Patrick Lemke, who had this to say. Very emotional episode for sure. Although some of the animation was kind of choppy, especially in one part towards the end where it shouldn't have been. The show still has some great animations, but that scene looked like to me at least it was trying to be a Junji Itu, but didn't quite reach it. Great episode regardless, but that moment was my main complaint. Mm. Thanks, Patrick. Uh had to look this one up because I honestly I didn't know who Junji Ito was. Um I actually thought it was at like almost like a bleach reference or something like that. But uh for those who aren't aware, Junji Ito is a kind of Japanese horror manga artist um who's well known for a lot of things and there's like some great if you like if you like manga, maybe go on to IGN. They have a article from September last year where it's like the top 13 best stories he's ever done. Right. So definitely big enough that he's getting listicles <laughs> on IGN and type of thing. But uh, definitely one set outside my wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, but I suppose the, the the point, I guess, towards the end of the episode is in the first episode, there, there is kind of some horror moments going on. So uh, I must admit, I didn't notice the choppiness in the um, in the animation. Um, but yeah, they may have been taking reference from uh, from some other forms of, of horror animation to uh, to tell that to tell that tale of what's happening to the characters uh, in there. So uh, I'm just I'm not I'm not sure I, I got the same choppiness feeling or it stood out to me because, as I said before, I know they have their certain style of animation for Invincible and they're taking inspiration from certain types of uh, of animation from the 90s and, and, and noughties. So so it's interesting that you say that it didn't kind of hit the level that you would have expected from the show there, Patrick. Yeah. But glad you enjoyed the overall episode, though. Yeah, same here. And I'm glad that it's literally one main complaint, only complaint. It's not a bad thing. Hopefully you found episode six better and there was no choppiness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. 
Our final piece of feedback comes in on Facebook from Dr. Bob Phillips, who says, You're right, Alan, the alien. I did think you were dead. Your hulking resurrection really shouldn't come as a surprise, given everything else in this episode. I do like being drawn down on comfortable sidelines of the superhero tropes, the consequences of Mark being gone, the possibility of a workplace romance and estate agentry, and the challenge of feeding alien toddlers are threads I'll be interested to follow. Will Colin let's just give his brother another name to be mispronounced by the show, sprout head accessories at puberty, perhaps. Ooh, interesting, Dr. Bob. So, potentially, our little new baby Oliver, as he's called now, which they can't mispronounce that, right? Um, so, uh, so let's see if he grows um, little tentacles uh, as he gets into his teenage years to match, the, uh, like to match his bug upbringing or his bug, uh, his bug birth. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> There's just two two little kind of two little uh, antennae, yeah. uh, just kind of twitching around. If worst case, he gets mandibles. That's even just weirder. That would be that's, weird. Then you get into like the body horror of the fly. And- yeah, yeah, potentially, potentially. I like uh, I like Doctor Bob's little gag there. Um, so it would be pronounced colon uh, on this show, like they pronounce Cecil, uh, which has oh. been a bugbear of uh, of Doctor Bob's since the beginning of the series that they pronounce Cecil. Bugbear, mine. Cecil. Like you saying Cecil. <laughs> oh yeah, I say it every time. We have to edit it out every time, every episode. <laughs> Get it back to uh, back to Cecil. Um, but, but you're right. There is lots and lots going on. He he talked about the challenge of feeding alien toddlers. We did find out in this episode that Debbie has learned she has to chew the food of um, of Oliver before feeding him because uh, their species don't have any enzymes to break down food. So she can't feed him any earth food. She has to chew it first and spit it into his mouth like a bug. Uh, and she's just getting used to that now. Oh, uh, uh, tasty! Yeah, I, I'm with uh, I'm with Mark here. Uh, let's hope his uh, his Viltrumite abilities come in sooner rather than later, so he may be able to use those abilities to break down the food. <laughs> he just pummels it, just for pummels a while. it on his plate a few times before eating it. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Dr. Bob. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Bob. And thanks, everybody, for your feedback so far. Uh, you can keep sending your feedback to us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Or, of course, pop on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Uh, you'll also find us over on threads at tvpodindustries or on in- Instagram as well for TV Podcast Industry. We'd love to hear from you wherever you can find us. Yes. Now, don't forget, we will be back next week with Episode 7. I'm not going anywhere. That's the name of the episode. We are going somewhere. We're going to be going over and covering the final season of Star Wars Bad Batch, as we're doing right now, Mm -hmm. along with, as Derek said, the boys are covering Shogun. Yes, three shows a week, people. We are going places because we have a lot to do. Yep, we're going to a galaxy <laughs> far, far away. We're going to Japan <laughs> and we're going to uh, to Invincible World every week. So uh, lots and lots of stuff uh, on the podcast. We hope you're enjoying our coverage of each of those shows. And thanks so much for joining us again for another episode of Invincible. Yes. So that's goodbye from us. Keep watching, keep listening and keep being invincible. Bye. Bye.